Go on to full screen there. Hey! Hey, we're live! Yay! Oh, it's not working! <laughs> Yay! Can everybody hear us? That's the important part. <laughs> Yeah, that's the difficult part, because this has been interesting. <laughs> this has been a technical adventure that I've been going on with Savvy McStower, and uh, he's been helping me out. Ah, whew. Well, yeah, it's been interesting for sure. Now, I will have to try to stop sweating bullets. I'm going to have a bit of a drink. Welcome to the feed, everybody. We got it working. That's the important part. It's that is the important part. part. Yes. The first time is always the worst. Uh, <laughs> at least we didn't have like we did where the whole system crashed, blue screen, mid screen, and uh, then we had to scramble to figure out why it blue screen to get it back online to finish your stream. So, I mean, it could be a lot worse. That is always, always a problem. Um, yeah. So, for everybody who is paying attention or has paid attention, I'm Steve, the storyteller from Vancouver by night. With me is Stabby McStabber. Shanky McStabber. Not Stabby. Shanky, Stabby. Shanky. Stabby McStabber. Uh, I think we said that was my daughter's name at one point, but she often <laughs> said said be uh, Shiv McStabber. Shiv McStabber. Of yeah, the DC, McStabber. I believe, of the DC McStabbers. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of us. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we're just going to be chatting about uh, various vampire storytelling stuff. Um, we're going to ask each other a few questions here and there, see what's going on. I think I'm out of focus, but I don't really care. I've got pretty much everything else up and running. I can be out of focus if I want to be. At least it's working. That's the important part. <laughs> oh. Oh. So first time's the worst. I mean, <sighs> it, it always is. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, like our first time, um, I think we were filming basically when it was kind of getting dark. And uh, throughout the entire feed, you'd basically see mine kind of getting dimmer and dimmer. <laughs> and everybody else, because we had everybody else on the widescreen. Um, oh, our first attempts, we didn't even get to the streaming phase. We were constantly, before we started streaming, doing recording sessions where we just record with OBS to, as a test run. And we must have done, you know, 30 different recordings at various points trying to figure out uh, audio and uh, video and getting the cameras to not look grainy and then trying to figure out, okay, but why is this audio not sounding right? Why is everyone sounding like we're in an echo chamber? It, it was... <laughs> insanity for months uh, before we started our very first actual live stream um, and then it was it was an adventure uh, streaming has been an adventure the whole time actually uh, yeah. I'm always uh, tweaking something changing something trying to make it a little better trying to improve because you're never the best the first time through you, you gotta yeah. you know, it's, a, it's a process if there's uh, uh, if there's ever anything wrong with technology it'll Go wrong. At least oh, once. Broken. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, we had one with it when we first started doing the guest player setup where suddenly uh, half the table couldn't hear uh, when we were doing the prep, and I ended up in my storyteller's outfit crawling under the table trying to trace down why we lost two of the headsets at the table. They just stopped working. Um, uh, uh, we had a doorbell ring during stream once. That was fun. Uh, that was recently. Uh, right in the middle of the stream, we get a doorbell ring, and I was like, okay, I guess we're taking a break now, guys. We'll find out who's at my door. Oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, I've got a cat here, and I can probably guarantee you at least once during this particular feed, the cat will enter into a meow fit and demand food, that sort of thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty much a, it'll, it'll be, it'll be another part of the adventure that we're on. My wife has seven cats, um. But they're not loud in the streamer, so <laughs> that's just the rule. Because I don't want to. We've got a player that's allergic to cats, and then I don't want to have to get cat hair off the table constantly. Uh, especially this, the mat right here, that's the board game mat. Uh, it holds cat hair pretty, pretty well. So I'd rather. Oh, yeah. I imagine so. It probably just collects. Cat oh, hair. and if we took the when we were doing Kingdom Death, and we were playing in the leaves under the table, because this is a game vault table. Uh, it was even, cat hair would get even worse. 
because it was just collect in the corners of the game ball. Oh yeah, yeah. that yeah, because we uh, I think it was Wormwood. Was it Wormwood or was it another company that had like the table where you could crank the side and it would go up and down like that? Uh, would, that is uh, that would absorb cat hair. The Wormwood. Uh, with crank ours actually the game ball goes up and down it but it doesn't crank you you just there's little things that you turn a rotating uh, platform that lifts it up and down yeah um, i mentioned a company that made the table but i don't like them at the moment because they still have about 350 dollars worth of my stuff they haven't sent me uh and we're on month uh well, march will make a year so uh yeah i'm a little upset so i'm not giving them any advertising yeah, that's understandable. Okay, yeah. so I do have a few questions prepared, but probably not many. If anybody yeah. has any questions on the feeds, let us know. We'll ask them. Uh, my first question, which is to, I guess, cover the two or three people that are paying attention at the moment, uh, would be um, how did you get into storytelling in the world of darkness? There's actually a funny story for that one. Um, I, I was a D and D player for a long time, uh, years and years and years. I, I've always been the dungeon master. We we play D and D. We play Gamma World. We played pretty much everything in the '80s and '90s that was released. We played it at least once, normally more than once. Um, and one night, we were at my house and we were supposed to play Dungeons and Dragons. It's a Friday night. My buddy came over and said, "Let's play this instead." He had a new book in his hand. It was Vampire, the very first edition. Uh, this was back in 93, as a matter of fact. And I'm like, okay, cool. I thought we were playing D&D, but, you know, I'll play a new game. And he, I said, so who's going to run it? And he said, you are. Okay, so I had 30 minutes to read the rule book, figure out how to make characters, how to play the game. And uh, we started playing it that night. And uh, we played quite a bit. And then when I got in the Army... Uh, turned out there was a lot of vampire players in the army. Uh, the funny part in the army, though, is one thing I noticed was most of the vampire players were officers or more of the senior enlisted. The the lower ranked enlisted played a lot more things like Shadowrun and Dungeons and Dragons. It was kind of it was an odd kind of a, a demographic. The the elders and the neonates, basically. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and that was the odd demographic of it. But I played it all the way up until '99. Uh, when I got out of the army, I stopped playing all RPGs. I didn't have players anymore. Uh, and then when LA by Night came out, uh, I started watching it. Of course, I got hooked. And my wife saw me watching it, and she was curious what it was, and then she got hooked. And then she's like, I want to play Vampire. And she'd never played a game before, any tabletop RPGs. Uh, she played computer RPGs, not tabletop. So she decided, you know, she wanted to play one, and I said, okay, I guess I'm dusting off my storyteller outfits and I'm going back to storytelling. And that's, you know, how I came back into it after a 20-year break. Uh, well, but, yeah, like, I, I'm actually hearing that particular story repeated many, many times where people say that L.A. by Night brought, every, brought them back into Vampire oh, Masquerade. Like between L.A. by Night and Geek and Sundry and groups like Roll For It and... Uh, those kind of those channels that are streaming vampire games and role playing games in general, it's really done a resurgence in all the games. I mean, I'm seeing a lot more than I've seen, you know, before at all. So that's great. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. Good to see that the hobby is back. Yeah, it's a it's a huge credit to um, the you know the critical role folks and uh, Jason Carroll from White Wolf that. You know, like, I keep hearing it over and over and over again that, you know, L.A. by Night actually brought people into Vampire, not just brought them back from, like, 20 years of not paying attention to the books because they went with Requiem, their Requiem line, and they ignored yeah. Masquerade. There were, well. I'm not going to lie, there was a, a stigma attached to Vampire for a while, especially in the late 90s. Um, I didn't see as much the the... Uh, players that acted in the ways that gave it a bad name for a while there, but it, there was a stigma to it. And watching Jason Carl and them do it on LA by night and seeing, you know, the the non cringe fest kind of method of playing the game, yeah, it really helped bring people back to it. it you know, it wasn't the so called edge lords playing or the ones who are trying to 
uh, live out power fantasies in a game, it was, you know, great production value show. Yeah, uh, there's, well, arguably it could be said about X that he's a bit of a fish mouth, but, you know, he's, he's not really. No, I thought he was at first. <laughs> I really did at first, but I, yeah. I have the opinion that uh, Xander, his X is the best sad clown I've seen played. Uh, most players cannot pull off that clown mount. Tell you, it's a very difficult uh, way to play without being a fish mount. Yeah. Uh, he skirts the edge, but he doesn't really cross it. Once I got a, a view of his depth, if he was always that, you know, goofy, funny, that he'd be fish mouthing it. But the fact that he has those brief periods where you can see the pain in it, yeah. Or if he pulls off. He's the best one I've seen do it. Uh, it's tried a lot. Yeah, but it's yeah, you know. it's uh, it's it's one of those things that, as a storyteller for myself, like I definitely restrict Malkavians to my I, players because it's just like, it's it's really really hard to do well or even adequately. That is just not even remotely feasible I for most players. Fish mouse for that. <laughs> I I hate fish mouse. Uh, I have a Malkavian I played with B Dave in his Patreon games. Um, his name is Dr. Samuel Ludlow. Um, and I, when I read B5, I saw the new hunger mechanic and I liked it. And I decided, what if I could leverage the hunger mechanic for uh, the Malkavian's curse? So, what I created was a character that has derealization, depersonalization syndrome, where he's not sure what's real, uh, especially when it comes to him. He doesn't feel that. He's in control of his body like someone else is controlling it. But I use the hunger mechanic to control it, but it's inverse. So when he's at low hunger, uh, the lower his hunger, the more he doesn't feel he's in reality or doesn't feel anything's part of it or the universe exists. But when he hits hunger three, he becomes mostly normal. When he hits hunger four, he becomes very detached because he's gone to the other end of the spectrum. And of course, hunger five is the beast. Yeah. So I created an Alcavian that has the skirt the edge of hunger just to function. You know, drop yeah. too far, he loses yeah. himself. I like it. I like hard. it. <laughs> and actually, uh, everyone who's played with him so far, everyone said the same thing. When they first see me play him at hunger one or two, uh, they're worried on fish mouthing. But as soon as they see the progression as I go through the hunger phases, they realize that, no, this is actually a very deep character with a unique mechanic. And I change my body language and my speech patterns. It all changes with the hunger. Right. So it's in Beta Malkavian, it's not fish mouth. And because it's hard to not cross the line. Yeah, it's, it's really hard. Also, Rose Bulbasaur. Hello, Rose. You're on the chat. That is uh, Rose from my game. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I, I will say, I enjoyed watching your game last week. Um, my players, we had two new players back in February when we started our, our we actually started playing our, our Chronicle in February. We had two brand new players to the table, which was Steve Perry and Lily Sanger, which is my wife, and Urian. And uh, then we had two veteran players, which is the Quartermain and Locke. And watching your players play last week, it was really fun seeing the new players again. Because uh, Urian and, and Lily, real quick. Uh, got past the, the new player, especially like in Lily's case, she watched so much Ellie by night and then watched all the role for it and then watched, you know, a bunch of other vampire streams. She had a lot of uh, not experience in the game, but watching others play it and yeah. to see the new players again was just, it was just great to see it because as a storyteller, you don't get to see it often. And even when you do, it disappears pretty quick. Well, that, that's actually one of the reasons why. I kind of put together this particular crew because they're all kind of new-ish players. Um, uh, Haley uh, has played like D and D and stuff like that before, but that's what I was going to ask. Do they have a? Do they? Some of your players have a background in other games, or just yeah, yeah. New uh, I, I believe Kelly and Rose have played some games. Rose, fill us in. I don't know. Um, but uh, I actually met uh, Kelly and Rose. Uh, there was a thing that we did here in Vancouver, which was called um, Geeks versus Nerds, where there was uh, two teams. It was like an open live debate. 
So you would get together with your team for like the week before and you would create characters and just determine who you're going to come in as. So you'd have three people on stage for the geeks, three people on stage for the nerds. And we were put on the same team uh, for this one particular debate. And I, Rose, fill me in. I can't remember what the debate was, um, but it was basically, you know, it's like, it's like who would win in a fight, Goku or Superman or, you know, like... Who's yeah, the we best? don't have anything like that around here. Yeah, who's the best defender of the night? Is it, like, Batman, or is it, like, you know, Noir Spider-Man or something? Just, like, take two random random things. Uh, the first one that I did was um, the Mass Effect, whatever their antagonist is, I think it's called the Reapers, against the yeah. Zerg. Uh, Reavers, I think it was. Right? Reavers, yeah, and the Zerg. So it's, like, which is the biggest interstellar threat? And I was on Team Zerg for that one. I was, uh... Oh, Rose has actually done LARP. Okay, yeah, this is way more fun, she's saying. <laughs> I, I did... I LARPed one time. I did a fantasy LARP one time, a long time ago. I actually, it was about a m month before I met uh, Relan, who became my wife. Uh, I had done a LARP. But LARPing wasn't really my thing as much. Uh, I actually, uh, I come from a bit of a LARP background. Like, the, the first time I actually played Vampire the Masquerade is when I was, I think, 17 or 18. My brother brought me to his group, and for some reason I got it in my head to roll a Ravnos. I don't know why. Don't hold that against me, please. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, because of when I played, I missed out on the Ravnos. I missed out on a lot of the ceviche, uh, because of that gap, that 20 year gap, I missed out on Giovanni. All those odd, you know, separate clans weren't part of that La Sombra. They yeah. weren't part of the first edition book, uh, the edition book I had. And then I took that 20 year break and I come back and I'm like, oh, I'm missing 20 years of lore. Uh, and I've been playing catch up since then, trying to, to catch all the lore I missed because, you know, you missed a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, that's why I'm looking forward to the, the player's guide and the uh, uh, Cult of the Blood. Or Blood Cults, whether that book Yeah, Cult of the Blood, yeah, that's I believe it's called. Yeah, because that one's going to be, you know, it's going to add some of these clans that I missed out on, because while I can find rules from the old editions and read up the histories, uh, I'd have to convert it all to B5. Yeah, and Rose has just mentioned that the one that Rose and I met at, and uh, Kelly was on our team as well, was Harry Potter versus Naruto, which supernatural team best overcame their team years? And she at the time was playing J.K. Rowling, who I accidentally wrote in a bit for her where she essentially, it was like the battle sequence, sequence of the, let's like, okay, describe what would happen in a fight between the two. And basically, <laughs> J.K. Rowling turned into like this, like, overpowering god character, like, rewriting everything like optimus prime shows up and <laughs> um, well, I mean, if you're right uh i guess um yeah but wow yeah see we don't there's nothing like that around where i live it's i mean we had a, i'm lucky that i have the players that do at my table because uh they're all co-workers of it of course my wife or were co-workers lock used to work with me uh, but locally around here i don't know if i could find a player uh, if it wasn't the people I work with, because I'm not sure. I haven't seen many groups of them, you know? Yeah. Uh, we have one friend uh, that plays, but she's so busy that I doubt we could get her to, to make it to play with us. Because, you know, uh, we actually gave her a shout out on one of our earlier streams because her husband passed away. Uh, we actually uh, dedicated one of the games to him because he was a big gamer. Uh, and, but, she don't have time to play, so, you know, yeah. if we had to find new players, I'm not sure how we would. Uh, <laughs> that's actually part of the reason I started doing this online guest thing for our stream, where we're adding players online to our table session, because uh, the options to fill in players, if somebody had to leave, or when people think, you know, people who have vacations, they have things they have to do other than play games, I need to be able to fill in somehow. Uh, yeah. Especially when you go to stream, because you want a consistent, you know, schedule. You want to, if you play, if you stream on Sundays, you want a consistent stream. So you've got to plan for that in the long run. Yeah, that's, that's kind of why um, 
like Vancouver by night, for example, we do uh, we do it like every last Saturday of the month because just you know everybody has lives and you know I'm only available on weekends. Some other people aren't available at certain parts of the weekends, so we have to like kind of finagle it around that and try to make sure that you know. Yeah, it's, it's the personal lives, and that's one of the hardest spots. You know, when you're a kid, it's easier to play these games. You're a teenager, but once you become an adult, yeah, it, everyone has lives, and it's hard for the adults to get it set up. We play every other Saturday, normally from two p.m. to about eight p.m. roughly. Sometimes a little earlier, we and sometimes a little later, and we record those. Uh, we break it into two, uh, two to three hour sessions for us to stream on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, that way, we only play every other week because you, we couldn't do every week game. It's just there's, you know, then we nobody would have any Saturdays. Yeah. And, you know, there's things that have to be done on the weekends for when you're an adult. Uh, so that's why we did the every other week, and then but we break it into a weekly Saturday or Sunday stream. Uh, and in this case, because of the Thanksgiving holiday, we had, you know, two of the players who couldn't make it because it's a holiday, right? Yeah. So what we had to do was break it into uh, we had to figure out how to fill the extra two weeks between when we do it, which is why we did the behind the screen episode where I talked about uh, the last two parts of chapter one of my chronicle and I discussed how things could have been different, how it could have gone. And then today, of course, we have a letter a letter from Lily, which is uh, my wife's character. She's going to do an in-character summary which of I, our whole first chapter. Which I am really looking forward to, by the way. Like, I definitely it, want to see love, the revelation. Oh, it's going to be one too. I, I love the idea of the summary though about every 10 episodes, maybe more or less, depending on the pacing of the game, because it's it's kind of overwhelming if you're new to a stream when you look and you see they have you know 20 episodes that you haven't seen to try to know what's going on and then find the time to watch all those 20 episodes you missed. Yeah. Uh, so if you do a summary every once in a while, the people know they can just watch the summaries and at least be aware of what's going on and be able to follow the stream from then forward. And uh, it just worked out that this gap when we have, you know, the players couldn't make it a perfect time for us to do one of these kind of streams, you know, where I've done my behind the screen and then Lily's going to do her, her story and it fills in the gaps and it helps the viewers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's kind of like the quick recap in front of an episode on like Netflix or whatever that you can yeah. skip, but you or, know, you don't uh, want to skip it in this case, right? <laughs> the LA by Night fans, the Ramona bits were, yeah. Uh, before some of the seasons Ramona did her sketchbook, uh, or even before some of the episodes, they had Ramona's sketchbook as well, where yeah. they were doing recaps of earlier things. Talking and, talking with the Rat Pack. Yeah. yeah, and that's a great concept to put in. And it's another thing about the Geek and Sundry show that was so good is they thought of these things. And for someone like us who are new stream, I mean, my stream is three months old. Um, watching those groups with their production quality and the quality of Jason Carl's storytelling and B. Dave and, you know, Erica Ishii and Nelly G and Alex Ward and just all of them yeah. uh, gives me a way, uh, things I can do to improve what we're doing. Yeah. And while we don't do, uh, I call LA by Night performance play. It's not an actual play game. It's, you know, these are actors and it, it's a performance. It's more of a, a show and a movie than a uh, what most people will play at their own tables, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but the performance value that they do and the show value is awesome. And I can pick up things to improve my game. Yeah, know? yeah. Uh, one, one of the things that I'm trying to pick up actually from Jason Carl is uh, being a bit more vivid in my descriptions of certain areas and certain buildings and stuff like that, which he does an amazing job doing. Yeah, it's, I, I'm guilty of the same. Um, all of us at this table playing no DC. So if I say they're at the Jefferson Memorial or if I say they're at Rock Creek Park, everybody at the table knows what they're seeing. Yeah. I don't have to go into these descriptions because, well, we all live in D.C., we know, but the viewers wouldn't know that. They don't, you know, it's one area I have to improve on, too, as well. So we're in the same boat here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, actually, um, to kind of, Repedal things back to uh, uh, wait versus 1918. Hello, you dropped in. Say hello. Um, back to the kind of LARP and the fish mouth thing. Um, I actually have a good story with regards to that. I actually 
in a, a friend of mine's LARP back in Ottawa, way, way back, setting the arms of the Wayback Machine about 15 years or so, um, I actually played a character that's kind of fish malky, but kind of not. Like, I actually designed him that way. Like, you would show up to Elysium with, like, the, you know, teddy bear wearing the big fuzzy slippers and stuff like that. But that was kind of his, you know, hidden character. Like, it was, he was a corporate CEO that owned a large company that was sending his representative, who just happened to be himself in disguise, pretending to be the guy that nobody should pay attention to and everybody should ignore. <laughs> that can be, that brings a question I have on this is, for those that have done LARP, like yourself and the ones in chat, um, is, you know, I know at the table games, the fish mouths are, you, most storytellers try to stomp down on that. Yeah. Is it any more acceptable, maybe not full fish mouth, of course, but is some forms of fish mouth more acceptable in a LARP or is it, you know, even more disdain compared to the table. Uh, and I don't have this experience in the, the LARPing of Vampire to Sea. Uh, though my wife has said that if uh, Jackalope does their thing and comes to DC with any kind of LARP event, like the night in question, yeah. uh, we are going. And if I don't want to go, she's going without me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, I've, I've found personally, like, not only through running LARPs, but also through... Uh, experiencing LARPs, uh, it depends on the size of the LARP, really. Kind of like, you know, when you're trying to get people together for a tabletop game, sometimes it's hard time management-wise to wrangle in. Uh, but if you're like a storyteller that's like one or one to five people in the storytelling team, uh, it's it's kind of hard to stomp out the fish mounts because it's just like, you know, if you're over here dealing with the combat for like an hour and a half over here there could be somebody fish milking it up and there's not really an incredible amount you can do about it you can like try to take the players aside and try to have a conversation with them and try to tell them you know hey mm -hmm. but and, you and know Julie, Julie <laughs> she brought up small soft and harmless fish milk is okay it's when they shrink and disrupt the game as a whole they become tedious yeah. I can agree with that yeah. um in a small table game, though, even the soft and harmless fish mouth gets tedious at times. But yeah, I could see in a LARP with larger amounts of people, uh, it's easier that when they get tedious just to migrate, you know, to be involved in something a little different at the LARP instead, you know, just to, to avoid that one. Uh, Versus has a good question, though. What's the view on min-maxing? Uh, min-maxing. That's a tough yeah. one. <laughs> I have mixed views at times. Min-maxing is fine as long as if everyone at the table is doing some form of it. Uh, Riffs. Yeah, it depends on the game. Vampire, even vampire, it can be okay. Uh, as long as your min-maxing is not taking away from the rest of the players. Uh, my stream has a combat-focused game rule. And when you start talking min-maxing, uh, if you're talking it in the narrow terms of she has devoted her whole game or build to being able to fight. That's what she does. And she's damn good at it. You could say she's a min-maxer with it. Uh, but she's done it aware that we won't have fights that often. When we do, I, I'll make sure there are some to include because you want every player to have something they can do and to be part of the story. Yeah, yeah. You want but everybody to be able to participate. Yeah. But she chose to focus on a combat character, and it's her choice. And she made a great combat character. Locke is awesome in a fight. Uh, and she doesn't take away from the rest of the game with this character because she doesn't look for fights. She doesn't start fights. But when one happens, she gets in there and tears shit up, and that's great. Uh, as long as the min-maxing is kept to that situation. Because even Lily, my wife, her, she's a corridor. She's built a social corridor. You could argue she's min-maxed her social ability uh, because she's a socially uh, specialized corridor. Uh, and it works fine because when there's a social situation, she does her thing. When there's combat, Locke does her thing. Uh, as long as it doesn't take away from the other players, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. You know? Um, uh, and uh, Julie Mandrake said, build a decent background and justify the max. It should be fine because for every max, there's a min and a good storyteller takes advantage of that. And Which is true. If you're watching any of the videos I've done on uh, my unique session zero method, because I have a non-standard session zero method, uh, 
uh, my session zero method builds those big backgrounds. It builds some amazing backgrounds. And if your background can't justify at the starting point uh, what you're building, you don't get to build it. Because uh, the way we do session zero with my games, you don't make your character first and then do your session zero. Uh, we do it reversed. Uh, your session zero builds up everything in your life prior to embrace. And then you make your character based on your backstory. Yeah. Well, so uh, it, we're reversing the whole process, but it makes better fleshed out characters, better rounded characters, and overall a better balanced character. So. Yeah, well, there was a uh, there was a bit in the I think it was the third edition Vampire the Masquerade like tabletop book that uh, there's like a, a, like a page and a half I think or just a full page of just like questions that you would ask like what was your character like before you embraced what was what were their parents like what was the child like like you know like just questions like that and it goes straight through up until like present day which is like yeah, absolutely fantastic do, for you. that's a lot that's very close to what we do uh the it averages for four players it takes us about four hours to do the session zero four to six actually depending on the players and we do it as a group everyone does it in the same room because i found that uh, not only does it help make sure that the player's natural tendency when they're doing it together is to interweave a coterie that would work together because they're all in the same room doing their session zero before they even make their character. Uh, and then we go in through the years of their life, and the other players at the table are there to ask questions as well about stuff. Uh, I have a whole, me and my wife did a whole video where we were making a, a Banu Akeem through my session zero method to talk about how we do it. Right. And I start off, you know, you're five years old. Um, tell me, where do you, where did you live at five, you know? Uh, what about your parents? Were they together? Uh, do you have any siblings? And then I throw questions like, you know, you have someone you thought was your best friend and they're having a birthday party, but they didn't invite you. Well, how did that make you feel? What did you do? And, you know, we go through these kind of scenarios through their whole life. Uh, sometimes the other player people will come up with things, you know, uh, asking questions about how they respond to events. Or, so, they, uh, they, so it helps to have the extra players there to kind of play yeah. off of each other. To, to throw questions it's we're not role playing at the time of you know full scenes but we're throwing questions about how you would react to this at this age or what if this event happened or this event did happen how did that change you how did it shape things and we jump through you know their whole life this way yeah. all the way up to embrace and the way i tell them to do it when you come to the table for my session zero have three clans that you would like to play um but be aware that your choices during your session zero are going to determine what clan embraces you. So if you want to be a Ventru, make sure that your backstory as we're going through it makes you someone a Ventru would like to embrace. Yeah. Um, don't try to be, you know, the sewer rat, or, you know, don't, don't be a sewer rat trying to claim you're going to be Corridor. <laughs> While there are exceptions to every rules and every clan does not automatically embrace a certain type, yeah. uh, there's a reason that well, the... Well, those fails, Right. The, the clans have an archetype for a reason. Yeah. And that's because while there are exceptions, most of them still embrace along these, you know, social lines. It's all about what vampire is about is these social uh, insular groups forced to work together. You know, yeah. The clan. So well, like even even if you do end up with your backstory basically being a Toreador, you could get ganked by an us anyway, right? Right. As part of and the Nosferatu and that can happen too. If that's, yeah. I try to keep it within the three that they choose, but I warn them to make sure your backstory matches the clan. And if you have three, and in some cases, you know, their backstory suggests there could be either two clans. Uh, there'll come a scene or a discussion we're talking about and find out what they're doing, where there'll be choices about which way they go, whether they, you know, go and investigate the sewer or do they, you know, run to get away from these guys in a hospital, these kind of things. And, because of how elaborate the scene is, you know this is where you're choosing which clan is going to end up embracing you. Oh, um, that's, yeah, that and, is... And it, it, I found for new players, especially like my wife and Steve Perry, who had a background in uh, Murder Hobo Pathfinder, uh, not role-playing <laughs> Pathfinder, Murder Hobo Pathfinder. Um, There's a difference? <laughs> yeah, there is, because there was no backstories, as far as I was aware of, with this, the way they did it. Um, so with no backstories, uh, to drop them with my session zero method made them create real characters. 
And from the very first session, they were in the headspace of their character because they knew how their character would react to being bullied. They knew how the character would react to physical threats. Uh, they knew how the character reacted to being, you know, socially uh, thrown as an outcast because this pop came up during their session zero. And by doing it before the character is created, it makes the character creation easy. You know what skills you have based on what we talked about you did in your life. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, you know whether you were good at school and would have some academic skills or not. And they made amazing characters to do it this way. Uh, and it is a unique one that I've never seen anyone do it the way I do it. And it came about, as I told earlier, that 30 minutes reading the book before we played. Yeah. I skipped over the session zero method because I went, and this is what I skimmed and thought they meant to do. <laughs> so that's how we did it, even though that's not what they really meant. But it was such a good way to do it that I kept it. Yeah, and as anyone is curious, uh, we have it's already aged out of my my Twitch. But if you go to the Big Savage Studios YouTube, you can see it. Uh, it's saved on the YouTube to watch the session zero method, and you can watch it there. And it was great with me and my wife going through the session. We even took questions from the the uh, viewers uh, while we did it, where the viewers would throw questions at her character to see how she react or situations her character was involved involved in. And just to expand on it, and that's actually in our, our YouTube. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'd recommend anyone who thought it was a good way to watch it because it's a different way to do it, and it's great. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, as a sub point, um, you mentioned Steve Perry earlier. Uh, that is no relation. No relation. No, no, no. <laughs> so and one of us had to LA, say it, right? In LA, his name was Jimmy Page. No relation. <laughs> Because uh, he's a he's a Kai Chief failed Malkavian. And the way I looked at it is, uh, just because you're a Kai Chief doesn't mean you don't have... All that really a Kai Chief is is you didn't get your clan bane or necessarily your clan disciplines, right? Right. So he has still got some Malkavian tendencies. He builds personas based on famous musicians that he hides himself behind to interact with people. Uh, so he's Steve Perry, no relation. In L.A., he was Jimmy Page, no relation. Uh, and when he moves to a new city, he may be somebody else. And he, and when you ask him about his old names, he says, oh, they're dead now. He kills them off in his head to become the other individual. Uh, he's not a Malkavian, so he's he's not got the full madness, but this is one of those unique quirks he picked up from his clan. Okay. You know? And to uh, kind of, again... Minor, minorly backpedal a little bit uh, back to the kind of min-maxing thing. Um, I'm actually finding that uh, V5 with the character creation rules kind of kind of blocks min-maxing to a, to a bit of an extent as a, a lot more than like uh, second ed or uh, oh, yeah. whatever it did with the merits and flaws because that was... You okay. can't take all shitload of flaws to buy a bunch of merits. Yeah. Um, you and can't buy Generation 8, which was what everyone called the uh, generation tax. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, if you buy 8, why wouldn't you? you yeah, if you have oh. five points in backgrounds, why wouldn't you be 8th gen? Why right. not? You know, like... You know, it, they, they did make it harder, and I like that. Uh, it's definitely harder to min It's not impossible, uh, but it's a lot harder. Uh, you can't just buy whatever skills you want, you know, because you, you pick Jack, the various, you know, Jack of all trades specialized, and you're supposed to have this many points and this many different skills. Yeah, yeah. Well, you as, you, as you sort of saw from uh, Kelly's character, because Kelly's character is a uh, Jack of all trades as sort of the archetype for that. And there was like three instances so far where Kelly's character needed kind of a skill like even at one which would have helped out a lot but he just didn't have it and it resulted in him frenzying in a body bag that's what rouse the blood helps for though rouse the blood throw that extra die yeah you know and right now i made sure because we had two new players to the game they're all 13th gen well until a certain individual diabolized somebody they were all 13th gen um because i didn't want new players to get you know boost into gen and have to deal with starting with a higher blood pool and all that. Uh, but we're talking about a Chicago game when the DC Chronicle is finally done. And when we go and do Chicago, uh, we're talking 10th or 11th gen characters. You know, we're going to start off. 
as more powerful characters uh, with direct ties to Chicago. So you may see the characters who they're either their sire or maybe their sire's sire is one of the big hitters of Chicago. So it'll make a whole different dynamic with that that you can't do with a new player, you know? Yeah, you definitely need more of an experienced player to do that sort of thing. Um, right. But yeah, I, I get a lot of shit from my wife on that. She hated starting at 13th gen because she doesn't like the fact that under V5, uh, higher gen vampires can ignore presence, dominate by burning willpower. You know? They just burn a willpower and they ignore it. Right. Uh, and I, I can understand your point, but that's how it is. You know, there's a pecking order of vampires, and somebody more powerful than you is more powerful than you. You know? Okay. Uh, the feed kind of went a little weird there. Is it still live on yours? Uh, I'm still live, and it still looks live on the uh, stream, so. Okay. Um, it's probably just my secondary computer being a dick. Yep. <laughs> I'm still uh, I'm watching it, you know, so I can see the Twitch, so it's still looking good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, feed's still looking good. Thank you, Old by Night. <coughs> I'm assuming that's Atlanta by Night. Now that you're no longer so bad, welcome. And, and to go to something that uh, Rose had said, you know, some played with min-max and some played to role-play, and I'm a firm believer in there's no wrong fun when you play vampire. Um, play the way you like playing. There's Sabat players. They love playing Sabat. I won't run a Sabat game because... I don't enjoy it. As a storyteller, I'm not going to run something I don't enjoy. I will try to make sure that the game I do run the players like, but there's room for all of it. Yeah, uh, I am... There is room for, you know, Sabat players, min-max players, non-min-max players. Uh, the only time you're playing it wrong is if you're making your fellow players uncomfortable or violating consent, you know, with your other players. That's yeah. the only time. Uh, yeah. Other than that, you know, it, it, there's no wrong way to play it. Play okay. the way to play it. Two points to make on that one. Um, I am probably one of the only people that I know from, I believe, my original gaming group that is super happy that the Sabbat are no longer an issue because I hated the Sabbat so much. <laughs> I do. <too. laughs> I understand like, people like to play it. Yeah. Uh, but it's not the kind of game I enjoy playing. Uh, Sabbat always to me struck. I mean, it's a I'm stereotyping it, but it did strike more of a, a vampire murder hobo style, or as people call it, Blade the Masquerade, or Vampion style. Uh, uh, I like more to Katana yeah. wielding, yeah. Right. And I'm, <laughs> some people enjoy it. I'm not saying they're playing it wrong. It's not fun for me, and I won't play that, and I won't run that. So, you know, I, I'm fine. People like to do it. It won't be at my table. It'll be on theirs. And hopefully they stream it, because I might even watch that once in a while, because uh, I can pick up tricks even from that kind of game. Yeah. But, well, yeah, it's, it's really kind of like, like occasionally you want to watch Shakespeare, but occasionally you kind of want to watch, you know, um, Pacific Rim, where, you know, you watch, yeah. you know, a giant robot punch a giant monster in the face, and it's like, well, everybody's like, oh my God, there was no plot. And it's like, well, that's not what I went in there for. I went in there to watch a giant robot punch a giant robot or a giant monster in the face, and that's exactly what I got. They delivered everything. As Mike said, sometimes we watch a Jason Statham movie. We're not looking for a deep movie. We're not looking for an interesting movie. We're looking for Jason Statham to punch people in the face, and he does. And that's what we watched it for. Yeah. And exactly. then we'll watch something beautiful later. <laughs> but, you know, you watch what you're And the beauty of Vampire is because there's room for that, you know? Yeah. Uh, some systems don't allow you to really go outside the focus as much as Vampire and the other World of Darkness does. Uh, that's one advantage I've found over World of Darkness is it, it really it's easy to play the way you want to without feeling shoehorned into certain styles of play. Yeah. You know, uh, Shadowrun leads itself to a very specific style of play. Yeah. Don't play that way. Um, you might as well not be playing Shadowrun. Well, Vampire's not that kind of game. Yeah, like, we could have, like, the social thing at Elysium's every night, or you could have, you know, a bunch of murder hobos who all pile in a VW van and drive from city to city and take care right. of things for the prince or the, the barons or whatever. 
Yep, and the rules allow for that, which is great. Yeah. That's part of why I like Vampire. My Chronicle focuses on uh, the personal horror and the slide of fighting the beast. How long can you remain human? Uh, uh, how long can you avoid becoming like the elders? Uh, you'll see that a lot with mine. All the elders are in some way screwed up, you know, bankrupt or, or something, with the exception of Art Morgan, which is a very special character. He's a tragic character. Um, and how long can my players avoid that? If you come to my game, expect that. But if that's not the game you like, yeah, go play the, go and play the game you like, man. Watch the stream you like. Yeah. Um, somebody versus said, what's your views on railroading? I'm not entirely sure what railroading means. That's this means forcing players to go and do certain things in certain ways. Uh, my Chronicle has a minimum of that in general because uh, I let my players pretty much do what they want. I've got good players. They learned very quickly that I was not going to force them to do things. Uh, if they don't have their own motivations to do shit, I'm not going to have you know the prince show up and say, I want you to go hunt this person down. No. Uh, why would the birds do that to the new, you know, neonates? Yeah. Or, you know, those kind of novices or anything. Uh, so we don't railroad much now. There are a few times I've used it for when I need to get a very specific story element, um, like in the recent riots stream of ours that we had, the uh, chapter 10, which is the end, or episode 10, the end of our chapter, where I needed the players to encounter Chaz outside the conservatory to uh, make sure that. I set the plot line later for the fight between the Thuzlas. Um And I try, it, I, a minimum of railroading was done to do it. But other than that, I tend not to, to try to force the players to do things, which is why I don't, as you'll see, I don't, I've admitted it, I improvise 80 to 90% of my of the session. Yeah. Because I don't know what the players are going to do. I don't know what they're trying to do. Uh, I don't. Uh, Julian says railroading is when the players with strong personalities were a shot. I just call that players who are dicks. Um, yeah. That's not railroading. To me. That's just a player who doesn't play well with others. Um, and I try not to have players like that at my table. Um, it's easy to control the tabletop. They don't get, get invited back. Um, part of why we have set up my guest program the way we did for our online guests is you get one shot to play with us before we decide whether you're going to be a reoccurring character. That way, if it turns out we have a player like that, they don't get invited back. You won't be reoccurring in the stream. Yeah. Uh, railroading to me has always been when the storyteller uh, forces people to do things. You see it more, uh, from my own experience, I saw it more playing Dungeons and Dragons. You know, when you have an adventure planned, they better go on it, you know, because <laughs> you can't improvise dungeons very well. Uh, yeah, with uh, with mine, and I'm gonna get Rose to hit mute for a second. <laughs> with with mine, it's just there's there's not I wouldn't call it railroading necessarily, but I definitely like you know it's it's kind of in the quest mode right now until everybody gets uh, a bit more settled in with their characters and they decide to go on their own routes. Not every group runs a free form like mine does. Yeah. Um, it actually was something I had to, to teach them to do. Uh, I know, especially in the face of my wife, when she first started playing, she's like, I, I don't know what to do right now because, you know, there wasn't anything being thrown at her. And I had to explain to her, well, what would Lily do then? She's running a club. And I'll throw stuff once, you know, when it seems like the story's lagging, a poacher, they had that happen right off. They found a poacher in their domain, you know, to give them something to pull them back to the story kind of a thing. But otherwise... I explained to him, don't think of it in terms of what I'm going to hand you. Uh, don't worry about what I've got planned. Let me handle that. You worry about what would your character do if you don't have anything directly, what would she be interested in taking care of? What would she, you know, what would that interest be? And she goes, okay, that makes sense. And then suddenly that's what my wife was doing. And we didn't have that problem anymore. Uh, same with Steve Barry. Quartermain and Locke had played enough vampire, they understood the format for that, you know? Yeah. That I'm not going to give them, you know, things to do. I'll throw events to keep things exciting, you know, to, to bring them back to doing stuff, but I'm not going to give them things to do. Come up with your own things to do because you're an individual. It's your story. I'm the storyteller. It's your story, you know? Yeah. Tell your story what you want to tell it. Don't worry about me. I can improvise. I can, I can do the things I need to do to keep, you know, things interesting. 
Uh, not every storyteller can improvise as well, and they need to prepare. And I understand do it, but you know, try to keep the let the players choose their way is how I, I run mine. Yeah. You know? Speaking of improvis- improvisation, uh, there was the section in my last game where I kind of had to think on my feet. Where it uh, there's one part of the feed where you see me kind of looking at my screen and looking at my iPad and trying to type some stuff in. Um, that was where the players decided to take the MacGuffin and go to the magic shop to investigate it, which I hadn't had planned until at least the next episode. <laughs> and they just threw the old curveball in there, and I was like, whoa, okay, I gotta think on my feet and figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> That is where I admit I have an advantage that not every storyteller has. I'm very good at the improvised part. I am not joking when I say 80 to 90 percent of my stream and our games are improvised. Uh, they literally are because I, it's the one area I'm really good at. I, I suck at voices. I suck at accents. Um, sometimes I suck at descriptions, uh, but I am very good at improvising. So I can, you know, throw what they whatever they want to throw at me. I can make it work. I can work with it and go with it and make it fit, you know, uh, and, and make it work with the story. Now, I see Versus has a thing about homebrew rules. Homebrew's fine. They're great. Uh, I use some. I threw out the whole social willpower damage from B5, that whole section about yeah. you'll take willpower damage in social situations. I don't, I don't use it, that either. Correct. I can tell, and all the players can tell, and anyone watching can tell if you've screwed up in Elysium. And you take a status hit. We don't need the willpower to do it. I can tell if you've been goaded enough to have to make a frenzy check without the willpower damage to do it. I'm fine with it. I've changed some of the Diablo rules. I don't know why it's only uh, strength plus, uh, was it strength plus what, uh, the other skill for the Diablo? Uh, why is strength involved at about whether you can drain somebody's soul? Could you use strength or, you know, you're trying to brute force rip their soul out when you're Diablo rising? But what about, you know, resolve, whether you can see it through to the end, yeah. knowing what you're about to do. So homebrew is fine. When you do something like L.A. by night, you need more homebrew rules than you do for an actual play. Yeah. Uh, performance play needs uh, to make sure that you keep the performance going. Uh, Jason Carl is amazing for that. Uh, oh, yeah. and his ability to keep the story going, keep it on track, and to keep... Uh, the flow and the story good and multiple uh, multiple threads all running at once. Yeah, like he's great got, for that. Yeah, but you need the home rule to do that sometimes, and need to have a lot of you need to be very loose with the rules because uh, people aren't watching the show to watch Victor get staked and murdered by Vanavar when they step in Elysium. You well, know, you might not be, but well, I thought <laughs> uh, so. There's a certain amount of uh, as even B. Davis said, the players have a lot more leeway. Uh, in Jason Carl's uh, L.A. by Night that he would at some of their other games because he knows it's a show and it's a performance and you want to keep that tension high but keep it, you know, flowing for the so- show. And, and part of part of keeping the tension high uh, with Jason Carl is he has, like, multiple threads all going at the same time. Like, in his know, ominous outfit, you make a note? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's a great way for he the way he does that. Uh, when you go to an actual play, uh, our stream is pretty much all actual play. Uh, we use some home rule rules, but not as many. Uh, Near Dark Studios, which does a great Chicago by Night game, uh, they do. I consider their game a mix of the performance play and actual play. They're like right in the middle, where they put on a good performance, but it's still an actual play. Yeah. Uh, they're right there at the middle of it. Uh, roll for it is right about there in the middle because if you watch the roll for it, sounds of silence. There's a lot of performance, but also a lot of the actual, it, they're right in the mix. Ours is more of a pure before, uh, actual play where, you know, you'll see a lot more rolls in our game. Uh, we roll a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's where we don't use as many home rolls. Uh, I do have a couple where I think it makes sense. Combat, uh, strength versus brawl, strength plus melee is not the only way to fight. Uh, Bruce Lee was not a strength fighter. He was a, a, a agile dexterity fighter. So That's I nice. let people pick. Right. I bet let people do when you're going to fight. You can do dex plus brawl or dex plus melee or strength plus brawl or strength plus melee. Are you a fast hitter or are you one of the you know I'm just going to brute force my way through it? Yeah, I, I I generally tend with those particular types of roles to determine 
Like, I base it off of what the player is actually doing or what they describe to me that they're doing. Like, if they come in with the big overhand, you know, swipe down with the sword, that's going to be a strength in melee. But if they, like, go to, like, poke somebody in the face, you know, that, that'll be dex. Now, do you allow them, when you give them a set of skills, do you say, use this skill, you know, tell them, roll, you know, composure plus, you know, insight. Do you let them, if they want to roll a different set of skills, if they can give you a persuasive reason why they should use this attribute and this skill instead, do you let them roll that instead? Oh, yeah. I yeah. Do that a lot. I Kel- Kelly it. actually, uh, I believe Kelly did that in the last episode because I... I think it was a wits and investigation role. And he was like, well, what about if I do it with wits and insight? And like, I'm trying to, trying to find insight into this sort of thing. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, do that. Whichever one's higher. Yeah. Go nuts. I missed that part. That was probably when I was prepping because right, I had to ditch out of yours a little bit earlier to prep for, you know, us I, starting ours. I and think that was when the midstream, you actually put up a message. I think yeah. you were doing, doing something then. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, it was right and, when they got around the Swiss Chalet area. <laughs> and I like storytellers that allow that, uh, that let their players, uh, you know, well, I'd rather this skill, and yes, the players are going to pick skills they're better at. That's fine. As long as they can come up with a persuasive reason why yeah. uh, they do that. I'm fine with that because, you know, that, that shows they're engaging. They're thinking about it from their character's point of view, not just their point of view. Because if it was just from their point of view, they wouldn't have a reason to use those skills. You know, they wouldn't be able to tell me why they should use them. Yeah, so that's trying, the thing like the character. Trying to uh, basically craft a better story by being more engaging in the actual like roles and the story right. and that sort of thing. You know, they're not just listening to me and rolling by rope. You know, that I said roll this, roll it. Yeah. Uh, they're thinking about it, and it makes it a better story overall, and it it makes them feel like they're engaging as their character. So. I like storytellers to do it that way. Uh, I've seen storytellers that pretty much dictate the skills, and that's what it is, and nobody ever questions it. Yeah. Um, you know? Uh, let's see. We're admittedly going to be more performance with being a troop of actors. All by night said that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, totally. You know, it's a hard line. You can't really always say everything is a performance play and everything's actual play because we were an actual play game for our stream, but. I mean, look at me. You know, this is not actual play outfit. No. Yeah. You know, really, it's always dressed as her corridor. Uh, Quartermain has got his mask on. And his the hat mask, yeah. yeah, he is being Quartermain. So we're all, you know, a little bit of performance is in our game, too. Uh, but I still say, you know, the more of the actual play, the performance play uh, probably would have a lot less uh, out of character banter. Yeah. Uh, we have a bit of that at our table. But that's because you know we're a group of friends playing that just happened to stream it to share. Yeah, well, it's if it's if it's fun, like if you're yeah. having fun, then it'll come through, and then the fans will probably have a bit right. more fun. Uh, Rose yeah. actually said on there too, uh, actor right here, improv is my jam, and Rose is a really good uh, improv actor because um, she basically <laughs> uh, there was a point in our session where. Like, it's the first time in any actual play or any uh, stream, any role-playing session that I've seen where somebody who's at Hunger 2 who heard the voice of the beast in the back of their head saying, it's okay, go ahead, drain this guy. Oh, and, I, I, I've stolen that from Jason Carl. His, yeah, his, so, his, so, his, so I. I, I <laughs> but it was, it was the voice of her sire. Yeah, and that is one of the greatest things he's done on his stream for... There's gonna be, yeah, there's going to be some a, a bit more backstory built up into that. Spoilers for everybody, but, you know, it's just like with the relationship between her and her sire, if her sire is like, go ahead, drain him, finish him off, go ahead, you know you want to. And she basically just looked at me and went, okay. <laughs> but we don't have to use the beast for that. Uh, we have Steve Perry for that. Oh, um, yeah. Steve Perry will go along with any bad idea anyone at the table has. Um, he's five humanity and he's an enabler. So, you know, Lily says she diabolized somebody, and Steve Perry's like, cool. He was fine with it. He's like, okay, sure. You know, Lily comes out of her dungeon area with a, a, a 
basically desiccated corpse. He's like, nice corpse. And that's all he says. You know, we, we don't need the beast for that. We've got a player that does that. Yeah, and um, Rose, is, Rose is saying on there, too, it was the name Panda that set her off. Yeah, I, I, I'll I admit, I, I twisted the old heartstrings with that one and just, just twisted the knife a little bit. Oh, well, I've done it. There's been <laughs> a couple heavy scenes uh, we've done where we've had to take an impromptu break for the uh, for the good of the players, you know, for the for a emotional break so that we can defuse a situation, a scene that was particularly heavy. Uh, but, you know, talk about setting people off. We've had a few that we've had to, okay, we're going to take a break real quick just to, you know, smooth over the what happened. Light, lighten the mood a little bit. Well, not, not light the mood and to, to vent the bleed, as uh, the Cabra Derek always says, you know, a little bit much bleed in that, that scene, and we've got to uh, take a break so that we can ease it out a little bit because, you know, it, you're, you're trying to play a dark game, but you don't want to. You don't you know, want to get too dark. Fire. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, that is pretty much the only, like, that was only one of my questions so far that we've covered. Uh, we get, oh, I can talk. As you can tell, I love to talk. I have a question for you. What made you start wanting to stream? I know why I started, but why did you want to start streaming? Oh, uh, yeah, it's the, it's the classic story. Like, Jason Carl, LA by Night. He got into it. I that brought me back into it, and I'm like, man, this is awesome. Like, I, I think I should start running a game again. And it's like, um, with uh, with Rose and Kelly, uh, we were kind of uh, geeks versus nerds shut down. So we were kind of, you know, I was like, we should do something like, you know, we should all do something together, like film something or like make you know short movies or something like that or. You know, we, we're, we're all creative writing people. We could, you know, we could throw together a script and go and film something or, you know, do something like that. And then uh, I was, it was uh, second season, I think, of uh, L.A. by Night, where it was just like, and I was watching it with my wife and I'm like, you know what? We could do this. This is what we could do. And, you know, you guys are actors you know, we, we just need a few more people, get them all together, and we could, you know, do, like, an actual play, like, live live stream like this. And, you know, they were they were getting into it. And Rose is saying we really enjoyed each other's company, too. Like, we, yeah, we really we really gelled all together with uh, with that particular team because we were on, uh, we were on Team Harry Potter for that one. And, uh, yeah, it was... Uh, Team Slytherin. Yeah, well, we actually well, uh, Kelly played a Slytherin on the uh, on the three person team. It was a Slytherin, like a random background Slytherin, um, as part of you know to, to represent Harry Potter and how much they hated Harry Potter. Uh, Rose played um, uh, J.K. Rowling, and then um, what was it? Uh, Swagrid? Yeah, oh, Swagrid. Wow. Yeah, there was, uh, it started off as Hagrid, but then at one point in the actual debate, the Slytherin cursed Swag Hagrid into the worst possible thing that they could think of. Or it was uh, J.K. Rowling grabbed the magic wand and cursed Hagrid, turning him into the worst thing she could possibly think of. And it was a, uh, it was a mumble rapper, I believe. Called Swaggered. Could have gone, just turned him into the Jersey Shore version of Hagrid. <laughs> and he came, he started, uh, J yeah, Rose saying JK turned him into a hip hop rapper. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it just, it went kind of uphill or downhill from there, depending on which way, like, it went downhill for people watching, but it went uphill for comedy. So, you know, yeah. win win, right? <laughs> Started just because the wife and I had been actually before we even talked about vampire, we were going to stream our board games because uh, she enjoys watching me get the crap kicked out of me at board games when we play together. Because for some reason, I always am the one who gets horribly mutilated over and over and over. Uh, but when we started playing the vampire, uh, she wanted to share the stories, and I love telling stories as you can tell. Um, so she was like, Let's share this because she had done on Twitter. Uh, stories from Lily's diary about our play sessions where she would write from her character's point of view on Twitter what happened in our sessions. 
And she wanted to take that, of course, to the next level of streaming it. Uh, it took us a bit to convince uh, the other players to stream uh, because, you know, they not, weren't as big on the streaming concept. Uh, but we eventually got them convinced to stream with us. And, you know, that's why we, we're doing it just for the, we love telling the story. Yeah. You know? And, and, and it's been fun. And that ended up with Steve Perry. So, you know, there's that. Yeah, Steve Perry. No rush. <laughs> Yeah, he, that guy, he's a character. He's, he, it, I've, I've loved seeing his character evolve uh, from what started off as just kind of a mild manner. You know, nobody gave him a second glance into this Humanity 5 uh, just morally don't give a shit anymore character. You know? So it, it's really interesting to see how that's, that's moved. Oh, yeah. Uh, like seeing... Let's see. All by Nate is saying, people have been making my D&D game to stream. That's where the creatives play to not have worked, so I decided we were going to stream. It would be Vampire. Yeah, well, yeah. Like, sometimes you just need to take a load off, right? And, uh... Yeah, we don't... I don't see this the stream as work. Uh, okay, well... This stream was work. Well... <laughs> The tech side has been work. We have gone through on the tech side six or seven different setups. You know, before we've gotten to what we're using now, uh, the board game has gone through just as many. Um, so, uh, getting a, a setup that I felt comfortable with, and there's still tweaks I want to make, uh, has been a lot of work. Uh, but I enjoy it at times. But it's been a lot of work. The, the streaming itself isn't, but the the, the, the tech setup stuff and you know, uh, we originally converted our dining room as a vampire-themed game room, and then when we started streaming, it became our streaming room, our streaming vampire studio room. Uh, but uh, now I'm looking at maybe not using it for this anymore and converting. Uh, we have a, a console room. We have a whole room in the basement that's full of just game consoles, turning it into an actual studio so that it's a little uh, better set up, and we can actually uh, use our dining room as a dining room again because... You can't when you have all the cameras set up, and I can't tear them down every week because we've got seven cameras on for our stream now. Yeah, you know, you can't tear down the seven camera setup and set it up every week. You just can't. No, yeah, you definitely can't. Five mics, two mixers, uh, you know, all the cabling for it. It's not something I can change out. Yeah, uh, and uh, all by night said will work, but also being camera ready and not having inside jokes and more personal discussion. Um, oh, we have that on stream. That's why I tell people it's natural fun. You'll yeah. hear that time to time. We've tried to minimize it. But you're still going to hear it because that's what makes it an actual play. As B. Dave said in an interview, uh, when you watch L.A. by night, you don't hear anything but L.A. by night. But it's fun to play at a table with friends uh, and because at a table with friends, you'll hear the inside jokes. You'll hear the you know cross chatter once in a while. And while we try to minimize it, we're a table of friends playing, so you're always going to get it once in a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like our our last episode, there was a, a lot of uh, out of character laughing with regards to it because there was just certain situations where it's like me as a storyteller, I am going to laugh. <laughs> yeah. I, I can see that land about night. I can understand where you're coming from. Is you know you're public creative, so you want to do a once in a while non-stream game for that. For you. I can I can see that. That's a legitimate uh, thing. Uh, for me and the wife, we're private people most of the time. Uh, so the stream is the chance for us to not be private, to be public. So we're the opposite, you know, side of that spectrum. Yeah, I just, you know, like with uh, with Rose and Kelly, they're actors. And uh, Haley's a bit of an actor as well. And it's just like with a bunch of actors together, like a par part of doing this is just to, you know, help them get their stuff out there as well, right? Like, Because yeah, online has become a thing. It's, it's funny. Uh, I know when everything first started online, nobody gave a shit if you were doing stuff online. But now the resumes, you know, online is part of your acting credentials. It's part of your, your, uh, your references of what you can do, you know? So uh, that's, that's great that the, the hobbies come to that point, you yeah. know? It really is. Uh, 
I would have never expected it growing up. Having grown up playing role play games in the 80s and 90s, uh, this wasn't something you did publicly, <laughs> you know. And and role Rose, play games were private. Rose just put, I remember having a great laugh. Forget why I might watch later. <laughs> well, there's a note to Rose and to the other people who are happy to be watching. Uh, I just published the actual stream, last stream, on YouTube. So now that one's up on YouTube and it's still on Twitch. Because apparently Twitch Prime is a thing that you get free with Amazon Prime. And they give you a bunch of extra shit so you can keep streams on there for 60 days. Yep. Who knew? Yeah, I, did. I figured that out pretty quick because that's why <laughs> I, 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 we've got ours on there for the 60 days. But I did, you know, months of research before I even started streaming, so. That's what I do. I'm an IT guy for a living, so when I'm going to set something up, I do all the tech research, you know, and really dive into it. Yeah. Uh, to, to figure out what, how to maximize what we're going to do. Uh, while we're not trying to make money on a stream, it's not a money-making venture. I still want as best, for, you know, professional kind of, a professional show as I can. Yeah. Uh, because it's my own OCD and my own personal pride. And you talk about actors and everything. I'm good at improv. I'm not an actor, never been an actor. I am a member of the International Society of Lesbians. Uh, I have my member number and I have my, my, my certificate that shows I am a member of the, the Society of Lesbians. But I joined that through my work on the uh, sound and uh, video portion of uh, acting. I did a lot of stage work uh, doing the, uh, the lights, the audio, the, the video. Uh, instead of working on the play in the play itself, so uh, I just don't have that. I never got to, to be on stage to, to learn the improv. I just picked it up naturally. Yeah, it it's definitely helps as a storyteller to be able to think on your feet. Because if you can't, like uh, I'd say, at least like even in the the best of games, like at least fifty percent is having a storyteller think on their feet, that sort of thing, and be able to interact with the characters as different characters, as oh, yeah. different NPCs, as different people, even if they come across the street, some, you know, jump a bum in a back alley, that sort of thing. And one of the tricks I've developed to help me do that is uh, I call them my location sheets. I build, uh, before I go into a chronicle, I build just a couple generic location sheets, you know, uh, bar. I make a sheet that just talks about a bar, who could be there, plot hooks that could be there, events that could happen. And I have a couple of those I've set up for various major events or places or things like that that could pop up in case I need to pull them out of my book to, to do a scene because I can't come up with a way to improvise it. Uh, and they're, they're one of the things I advise new storytellers to do is to create you know, these generic locations. I have one for Elysium. You know, who would be at Elysium on a random night if the players went there? You know, yeah. uh, what could be being talked about? Have just a sheet that has that written down, whether you need it or not. You may eventually need it, and then you have it done. You know, set it up as a, a pre-built thing. Yeah. I've done it for, for a couple of places in D.C., especially in the beginning. I use less of them now because I don't need them as much uh, now that the world is starting to flesh itself out more. But it's a great tip for storytellers to do these kind of sheets uh, because then you have pre-built areas that, you can use as part of your improv because yeah. your players are going to do something eventually you didn't expect. I don't care who you are, what you've designed, yeah. your players are going to surprise you at some point and go completely off rails. Oh, yeah, definitely. And you need to be ready for that. Yeah, you, know? yeah, you, uh, you definitely have to be ready for that. Uh, one of the things that I do is I create uh, something called the Game Bible or the City Bible that I use for the games where it's just like, you figure out who the prince is, who the seneschal is, who the background people are, the movers and shakers in the vampire society. They might not even be the primogen, but you definitely want to try to get the primogen council in there, which is where I came up for the idea of the Malkavian primogen and her particular situation. Um, because it's just like, you know what? What would happen if the Malkavian primogen was missing at the beginning of the Chronicle? Well, this... <laughs> and then you, you, you follow to its logical conclusion. There's your chronicle story. Yeah. Uh, I, I have an advantage because I'm using a uh, DC by night source book, which I've converted to V5, uh, updated it for the V5 meta, of course, and then 
uh, converted the characters to B5. So that was actually work was was built for me. That was actually my my other question. My second question. I was gonna ask you, um, like, for your NPCs, do you just use the Chronicle source book, or do you like do you mix in all of your other stuff as well? I, I have, there's a fair number of my own creation. Uh, I went through it, pulled out before I even started the Chronicle of the characters. I felt either would not have survived to this point or didn't contribute to the story, and I'm always tweaking that. Uh, but even I don't use them ever directly as written uh, because anyone can read the, the source book and know everything going on in the city. Yeah. So there's always little changes to each one of the characters to make them my own. Uh, so, you know, Art Morgan, his background is a little different than it was before. Uh, each one of them, you know, Glenn's a little different than he was. And, and just enough has changed that you can't rely on the source book. But the source book is still the basis of what I built. You know, okay. uh, but I do throw my own characters in because, well, DC didn't have enough vampires in the first place. No, it and didn't. I threw off the ones that I didn't think would have survived or really needed to be there. Uh, I had to fill out more people, so I've been slowly adding more and more, especially now that uh, DC is a Camarilla city again, uh, because B Vitel is left. Uh, he got run out of town. Uh, I, I've introduced more and more of them because they're coming to the city. Uh, because it's a new city, you know, uh, it's now, you know, led by a rotten bastard, Stanford Warwick, but he's a known Camarilla power player, so uh, people would come to his city. Yeah, you know? uh, well, uh, yeah, like like we discussed kind of in private before this, where it was like the uh, DC by Night sourcebook, which, which I got on the Humble Bundle like ages ago for the PDF, you flip through and you're like, Where's the rest of the vampires? Like, what is going yeah. on here? <laughs> and, and the sad thing is, if you play them exactly as written, it's 90 tro 90s trope. I mean, the characters, it was a product of the time, and but you very much see uh, the ideas of the 90s in the characters. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of trope. There's a lot of, you know, it's about Cave. you got to have multiple personalities. You know, uh, the other about Cave is a psychopath. Yes. You know? <laughs> so you really, you know, it's not fish mouth, but it's it's going through all. Everyone's just a stereotype yeah. of their character, and you got to change some of that because that's not how the games evolved. Ooh, you know. Uh, and uh, Rose has asked uh, Steve, "Did you use existing characters for our chronicles? Did you, did you come up with them yourself? I feel like I recognize some of them." I. That's an interesting story. <laughs> uh, for the NPCs. For a lot of the NPCs, some of the NPCs that we've already met, some we'll be meeting in the future, um, they're actually old player characters of mine and a few other players that I, I played with um, in various LARPs and stuff like that. Like Bo and Rico, for example, is the old prince of the city that we used to exist in. Uh, which is just, uh, yeah, it, he was an interesting character. He actually fought a gargoyle once and won. <laughs> wow, pretty good. Because like versus, versus brings up Kai Chief Steve. That's not the same Steve. It's the, it's a different Steve. Oh, that's that's different. Steve the storyteller. I'm talking yeah. with him. Yeah, yeah, Steve the storyteller. Uh, and then uh, recognizes Steve Perry. No relation. And uh, Jillian Mandrake, for example, the seneschal of Vancouver, who happens to be in our chat right now, will be played eventually by my brother, who happens to be in our chat right now. <laughs> I don't, because I took that long break, I don't really have as many player characters I can use to draw on. But I will admit, I've gone through like Chicago by night when I'm needing to get a couple new NPCs together. And pulled characters from Chicago by night, changed their name, changed one or two, you know, their description of how they look. Yeah. And then boom, I have a character. You know, yeah. different name, different look, boom, I can drop them in. Because if you they have a different name, a different look, nobody would recognize them anyway. And speaking of the 90s trope thing, um, like uh, the reason kind of why I brought in a lot of my own characters uh, is because I actually took 
a look at the Dark Alliance Vancouver book. And then I tossed it in the trash. <laughs> because it's just like, uh, no, yeah. no. A lot no. of it's time, and I yeah. understand that, but a lot of it didn't age well. Um, I love what I love what uh, they've done for the Chicago by Night book. I love uh, I, the Chicago by Night's awesome. You know, um, I'm hoping they produce more of the cities uh, along the same line. I want to see a new DC by Night book. I'd love to see how their interpretation of DC is different than mine. I'd love to see an LA by Night book. Oh yeah. Uh, considering everything I've heard uh, is that the LA by night show is mostly canon to the lore now. Yeah. Yeah. Cause uh, the, uh, the Malkavian, uh, Jan Jeanette, Jeanette, Jeanette Therese. Yeah. Blood Jeanette Therese. Yeah. They are actually in the bloodlines, the first bloodlines yeah. game, which was canon. And then they basically brought that over to LA by night. Yep, and it's going to be canon to, from what Jason Carl and B. Dave have said, uh, L.A. by Night, the series, is is uh, right now generally considered canon to yeah. the world of darkness. I, I know that there may be some things that get tweaked here and there before it becomes, you know, official, fully canon, but the show itself is generally considered canon, which is great. Uh, I'd love to see a new book for that. Uh, if, I'd uh, love to see, basically revisit most of the old books. A New Orleans by Night would be awesome. Yeah, for me. Uh, I can't speak about you know Vancouver and all that because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a U.S. guy and I've only ever played the U.S. I'm just uh, saying, if anybody from White Wolf happens to see this feed, DC by night over here, if he wants to write it, I'll write Vancouver by night. We can, uh, you know. Oh God, I'm not a good writer, but I would <laughs> my thoughts for sure. My yeah. wife is, you know, uh, she'd love to see them uh, get my thoughts on how DC might have changed. Uh, over the years, because I think I've crafted an interesting version of DC, you know? Uh, it may not be what they're doing, what they want to take it, but I like the way I've turned DC, you know? It, it's been a fun chronicle so far. It's just a lot of work. Oh, so yeah. I'm Chicago, because Chicago's already V5. It's not me having to convert everything to play it, you know? It's hard to convert that way. Uh, yeah, Mike... Uh, as Julian Mandrake is saying, survive your blood hunt, swear it off against the defenders. Yes, Julian Mandrake did in fact do those things, but he got really fucked up by the defenders at one point. That was... Uh, <laughs> Dr. Ludlow, Dr. Samuel Ludlow in, in the DC Chronicle, he actually dominated a Lupine. That must... Yeah, he... That's dice pool of, like, huge... Yeah, that is a... He dominated, that was in a, a game... Uh, it was a memoriam for the DC Chronicle, but it was a memoriam run by B. Dave Walters. Uh, he ran a memoriam for my Chronicle, so I could be a player in the Chronicle for once. Okay. So I played uh, Dr. Ludlow, and the whole coterie that you see on my screen was in L.A. This is before they came to D.C., which is why it was a memoriam. And the game was run by B. Dave as a storyteller. So I, as storyteller, got to have a guest storyteller run a memoriam for my Chronicle. And that's where I got to be Dr. Ludlow. And he actually uh, dominated Lupine. I think I rolled uh, like 10 or 11 successes. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, we tied. Uh, so oh, the, <laughs> so the, the Lupine did what I said, but in an unanticipated way. I told him to run to the beach to get him away from, you know, uh, attacking us. And he grabbed Lupo in his jaws and took him to the beach. <laughs> which was, I thought if I'm, it was a great way for B. Dave to do it. You know, for him to handle it. Uh, it was a tie, so how do you deal with the tie? You could have me ignore it, but it made a better story to have the, the Lupine grab my doctor and take off to the beach with it. That was that was awesome. And as a storyteller, to be able to have another storyteller run a memoriam for your chronicle, which makes it can into your game, was great. It, it's something uh, I, I encourage people to do that at some point to find a storyteller you can trust to run a memoriam or. Uh, one session for your chronicle uh, where the storyteller can be a player in it. One session. Just to be on the other end of your own chronicle. Yeah. Okay, you know? it, yeah, it's, it's hard to do, but... That is an interesting way of going about it, for sure. Um, then, uh, you know, 
as a subpoint, that particular get of Fenris may or may not have already shown up in Vancouver by night. So, you know, there's a possibility it might might have another Julian Andre get of Fenris confrontation. The werewolf that took the doctor to the beach is in DC. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Because that that werewolf worked with uh, an adversary of Lily's, who's a, a gangrel that. Uh, works for Blood Spiral Dancers or Black Spiral Dancers. There's an interesting dynamic there for that that hasn't fully fleshed out. And I'm not going to go deeply into it, but there's a reason why he's able to work with the Black Spiral Dancers. And they, they listen to him. Uh, so uh, this is a whole thing that this werewolf came to DC. So now they're going to have to deal with, you know, Bloodlow's there. And now, you know, another werewolf is there that took Bloodlow to the beach. You know? Yeah. And Rose just said, more hot werewolves, please. Yeah, okay. Can't argue yeah. with my players, can I? My wife just wants me to put some uh, corridor in the city that aren't a hot mess. <laughs> well, then they wouldn't really be Toreador, then, would they? I know. She's a primogen. I told her, well, dealing with hot messes is what primogen do. Yeah, that's pretty much, that's literally their job description. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, she just I, there's a lot of hot messes, but... All the DC kids are screwed up in one way or another. That's the whole thing about DC. Basically, it's, vampire it's, as a general rule, they're all hot messes. Let's be honest. Yeah, they are, but I don't know. DC seems to have a high percentage of just some really messed up vampires. Alt by night. Quote from my wife, a Malkavian with fashion sense is just a Toreador. <laughs> hey, Malkavian clan, best clan. I'm just saying. I will forever be a, a Malkavian fan. Uh, that's I bought the dog bite Malkavian ice box, and I'm the storyteller, and I have a, a dog bite, you know, Malkavian ice box because Malkavian will always be my my favorite clan. Uh, and well, because of B five, the Ministry, the changes to the Ministry made Ministry my second favorite clan. Yeah, uh, you know, the. Uh... As as a storyteller, though, you have to kind of be a little off. I mean, come on. You have to be, you know, a, a little bit quirky to want to herd cats on a weekly basis. I, yeah, I'm always the storyteller. <laughs> I, I ran over, you know, way over at this point 200 games uh, as storyteller, dungeon master, game master, whatever. I've played in less than two dozen as a player. So... Yeah, apparently I love storytelling and love running the games and hurting cats. Oh, yeah. Uh, but what I can tell you, it's because I'm good at it, and she's probably right. Uh, I've played with some players that tried to run games for me, and they just they gave up because, you know, they, they I'm as a player, because I know, I've run so many games, I normally see through a lot of what they're trying to do. You know, because I've been on the other side, I know the tricks. So, you know, I try to be a nice player, but I've got, I think at this point, too much storyteller in me to, to be a player that often, you know? Yeah, that's that's where uh, the LARP storytelling is. Uh, it's a, it, there's a lot more herding cats in that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, running a game with, like, five people is kind of challenging enough, but when you have, like, 20 people that are all... Doing their own separate things. It's, uh, yeah. Do it. I, my limit is uh, six players is the limit. I will not run more than six players. I prefer four to five players. Yeah, but, but I find four to be kind of a bit of an upper maximum because, like, beyond that, you kind of get into, especially with streaming, like, it's just sort of, like, I, I adopt, as a storyteller, the around the table rule, which uh, I like to refer to as, you know, like I start on one side or on the other side and I go, okay, what is your character doing? 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 And then if you have like more than four people uh, with that, it just, it'll be too taxing. It'll take way too long to do pretty much anything. Four to five is where I, I really do aim for four to five. Four it works well. I like five only because if one person's absent, we're back to a four-player game. Yeah. You know, that works well. Three, I I did run one when we had a sick player. We ran with three players, and we can do it, but I don't enjoy that as much. Uh, 
because you don't get the same dynamic when you get that low of a, a smaller number. I know some people love one-on-one games. Uh, some people like, you know, two people games. I don't get the same dynamic uh, for me, so I, I try to keep it four to six. Yeah. That's the number. Uh, I probably could handle more than that, but as Jason Carl says, there comes a point where you're you're doing a disservice to your players by having too many. Yeah. You know, you can't give them a quality game anymore. Uh, I play. I I help, I actually ran a D and D, uh, and played one, played once, and then ran one where we had eighteen people at the table. Wow. Uh, I ran it once, said never again. Played it on the next one. And then that DM said he would never again. And then we stopped having 18 player games. Uh, because, you know, seriously, that's just too many. And people are talking about tattoos now. About how yeah, I, <laughs> I'm not getting, I will not get a, a tattoo of any game uh, on me. Uh, uh, I already have a tattoo, uh, and I have an idea of what my next one's going to be, but no game tattoos. I just, I love Vampire and all that, but. I can't tattoo games on me because uh, my taste changed too often. Yeah. It's just the way it is. Eventually you might stop playing for another 20 years and then exactly. people will be like, what is that tattoo? <laughs> I only have one right now uh, at late on my night, but I, I'm going to get my second one at some point. I just haven't decided. I, I have an idea of what it is. I just haven't had it drawn yet. Uh, to get it, and then I have a third one I have planned, but uh, the artist that uh, I want to do it is in Japan, uh, and the artwork he has, if I wanted to have an artist here do it, uh, it would cost me $800 for the artwork, because I believe in honoring, you know, the uh, an artist's work. I'm not going to steal his artwork just to get it tattooed here in the States, uh, unless he'd give me permission to use it, and he would say it'd be $800, and I was his wishes on that because that's his art, you know. Uh, and Aki is the guy that I saw in Japan. It's basically like a sugar skull type uh, artwork. But if I ever go to Japan, I'm going to have to go see him to get it done because he does amazing work, and I love that one. It's the uh, logo. It's actually the logo of his studio. It's like the set piece of his studio, but it's amazing, you know. And I get it done down my whole back. So, yeah. It's true. There are wonderful tattoo artists in Japan. Yep. So, uh, you just had the riots in your game. Is there any hint you could possibly give the people in the chat of what's going to go on from here? Uh, yeah. Uh, no spoilers, uh, obviously, because we want to see it. Our next episode, of course, our, our sort of chapter two of DC by Night is titled Archimedes Fulcrum. And if anyone knows about Archimedes, uh, he is the one who famously said, uh, if you give me a long enough lever, I can move the world. So there's your hint and teaser about what's coming. Hmm. Uh, levers are about to be applied uh, to DC. Um, that's going to start not tonight. It's going to be next Saturday uh, or next Sunday. Tonight is, of course, Letters from Lily, which is going to have a big reveal uh, about Lily's backstory, you're going to find out she's been lying about a certain event in her backstory to everybody. Uh, you're going to find the truth of what that was. Um, and it should be a, a very interesting uh, revelation, and it's an important one that's going to be part of the story. So I uh, look forward to a darker DC by night. Uh, and the very right when we come back, Archimedes Fulcrum is going to have. Uh, it's going to shock a lot of people. There will be a lot of people going, damn, uh, because I already know the basics of what's happening. And it's going to be crazy. Um, you're going to see things you never thought you'd see from various people at my table. Uh, some ballsy moves are coming, guys. Uh, but it's going to be dark. Uh, the kindred as we knew them, it's, uh, it's not going to be the same. Um Certain central characters, I mean, we lost Amos. Uh, certain central characters, uh, revelations of their past are coming that's going to change how you look at them. Uh, certain individuals uh, are going to change who they are uh, because of 
something that was done during the riots that uh, they had been avoiding. Uh, and I'm not going to spoil too much on that, but expect to see the kindred of D.C. not the same. There, there's going to be a, a period of upheaval and a period of just some really dark story themes coming, uh, which is going to be great from a storyteller perspective. Oh, yeah. But the mood of the Chronicle is changing. Uh, we've gone into, you know, like like Star Wars. You had Star Wars. It was kind of ended up beat. And Empire Strikes Back was a lot darker of a story. Uh, than Star Wars was. Well, guess what? We're in the Empire Strikes Back portion of my chronicle. So we're going into the darker phase. There is no happy ending nice. for this chapter. Uh, there is no positive way to look at what's coming. Uh, and, and I hope that, you enjoy it as much as I'm going to enjoy telling that story. And that's just it, too. Like, as a storyteller, you kind of it feeds the creativity in you to have, like, a character like all these seeds coming up kind of at the same time. It's like you're a gardener, really, when you think about it. <laughs> yeah. And I call, I, I refer to my chapters, and I'm always talking about, you know, people. some people talk about story arcs, I talk about threads. I weave threads into the story. Uh, whether the characters follow them sometimes is a different thing, but I'm constantly adding new threads to the story to be used later, or for the characters to follow. And I've laid some groundwork for ones that I don't think everyone is going to fully grasp. Uh, one in particular, I'm not sure the players are going to understand the magnitude of because of we didn't stream uh, Art Morgan. Uh, he is the hippie gang girl that, you know, wow, man, like, yeah, that's like crazy. That's like heavy, man, you know, karma wave. There was a, a scene I he did that he stream, oh, he's great. But we didn't stream where he talked about why he is that way. Um, Art Morgan, for those that don't know, was born, was embraced in 500 AD. Uh, he is the brother of Xavier, the gang world Justifier. The older brother of Xavier, as a matter of fact. And this is canon to, to Vampire, you know, as a whole, to the, it is canon. This is who he is. And uh, Xavier chose to become the hippie. Uh, he saw what elders became. He saw what, as you age as a vampire, what you turned into. Uh, what you did, what you became, and he didn't want to be that way. Uh, and so he made a conscious choice to have his head altered by Mr. Dorian Adams uh, to uh, become what he is now so that he wouldn't be like the others. Okay, but, okay. But what happens if that slips? What does our... What if the wall crumbles? Whoa. That, what does Art become? A vampire who was born in 500 AD, a gangrel, a brother of Xavier. And we all, anyone who's read Vampire Lord knows what Xavier was and who he was and how he acted. Xavier helped kill Karsh. I mean, this is not a kindred that played games. And this is the older brother. Yeah, he's a vicious bastard. <laughs> right. So what happens if the wall and the careful personality, the mask that Art has built, begins to crumble. That will be explored in the next chapter. Mm. Uh, it's going to make a dark story. Yeah. Because you're talking about a vampire that is very, very powerful. Uh, it doesn't matter his generation. The age alone ensures power. Yeah. That's, and, that's what I really love about V5, where they put the blood potency and the generation and mashed it all together. It was yeah. just fantastic. Cause I, I really like that part of Requiem. Most of the rest of yeah, Requiem. I like Hunger, the Hunger Pool too. Yeah, the Hunger, the Hunger Dice is amazing. The whole Hunger mechanic was, uh, it changed Vampire from, or your blood from a resource management game to a risk management game. Yeah. And I think it adds a lot to the story where you're debating, is it worth risking the beast? To roll again, you know, yeah. Roll that round because that came up uh, like a fair chunk in an, even my last session where Kelly was like, "Yeah, do I want to scry this guy's soul?" Yeah. No. <laughs> we gloss over the hunting part. We use the the default pools for the predator types most of the time. Yeah. Uh, we only really role play it out when there's a failure roll. Uh, but being able to do that, you still got to find time to hunt, so you're still risk managing. Because most of the time you can't take a break to hunt. 
So you risk managing. Do I get hungry? Do I risk it? Yeah. You know? Uh, do I go to Elysium with three hunger? You know? Probably not a good idea, but, you know. I mean, you can't use powers. <laughs> you can't use powers, you get caught using. That's true. Because really what Elysium boils down to is you can do whatever you can get away with. You know, if you're powerful enough, you can get away with more than others. So, yeah, I love that. I love the, the combined blood pool or uh, humanity and, uh, or not human, uh, generation and blood potency. That's great because before all that determined where you were, where your was your generation, you know? Yeah. And, and then now, you could buy it as a background for like and now it's both. You yeah. could be uh, one generation but have a blood potency pretty high, or you could be, you know, a high generation with a low blood potency. Yeah. So, so there, there's a scale in there that wasn't there before. Generation isn't the end all be all of who you are as a kindred. So that's great. I love that that feature. I, I um, love that they took it over from Requiem because Requiem, uh, like, as as a game system, it was painful. <laughs> I don't know if you have much experience with Requiem. I read it uh, halfway before I threw it down and discussed. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, there, there's a lot of people online that still like Requiem, and hey, you know, you do you, right? But it's just it not really... Like, you know, if I, all, what you want to play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then it's like, but on the flip side of that, for me personally, just as my opinion, um, it's just like, you know, if I open up a rule book, like, I have, you know throw it up here for the people who watch it at home. This may or may not pop up in our chronicle at some point. It's the Apocalypse rulebook. <laughs> uh, it's, it, uh, you know, like, if I open this book, I want to flip to page, you know, 20 and see this particular rule, right? Like, I, but with Requiem, it was just sort of uh, like a scattershot of... V5 has a little bit of issue with that, too. Some of the rules are harder to find than others, but that's that's more of a layout issue, really, than yeah, anything well, else. You know, difficult at times, but like I, I find the merits and flaws with yeah. or the merits and backgrounds or whatever to be a pain in the ass to find. Well, and actually, I don't have my handbook where I can reach it. It's at the other side of my table, but I actually stuck tabs. There's little uh, folder tab things. Yeah, I've stuck to my book all the way around the rim of the pages and wrote down. Because I use them, I put the merits and flaws are, are just one little tab I can lift to open straight to. Discipline, straight to it. I've tabbed my whole book that way. Yeah. Uh, which which works great for me. Because then I can literally just open it up. Hey, Northern Shaman, I, how you doing? Kangaroo yeah. Shaman in the North. Is yeah, that... I see Northern Shaman in a, in a few of the vampire streams that I, I watch. So. Hello, Northern Shaman. How are things? Nope. But, yeah, so we're going back to your question. DC is about to be darker. Um, sure, we do our gallows humor. We laugh a bit. Um, we're going to have a lot less to laugh over with what's coming. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's not going to be nearly as amusing as it has been because, well, uh, the story's taking a dark turn. This is the Empire Strikes Back of a story. You know? This is the part where there's no happy ending. This is going to be bad. So it's going to be fun, but it's going to be bad. You know? <laughs> and then Rose put in, oh, why didn't I think of becoming a gangrel shaman? Hola. <laughs> I can see a gangrel shaman. That'd be an interesting one. And Rose, just for your information, it's never too late to become a gangrel shaman. It's kind of, you know, as I, as I, my players are one to say, uh, if I'm going to get killed, fine. I've got three, four, five more character concepts ready. I can make my next one. Let's go. That's true. Yeah. Yep. Lily's got a, a number of plans set aside. So when we, if she gets Lily murdered, she's got another character idea ready. She can go. She's fine with it. If she gets Lily murdered. Because there's <laughs> always this distinct possibility of getting any of your characters murdered at any point oh, in time with that murder. Yeah. And, and, and some, of the, some of the power games that, uh, that Lily wants to do with Lily... You'll see. She's got some moves planned that, yeah, she better have some backup characters because she can go wrong. 
That brings me to actually another point that I wanted to discuss actually with you, just to get your opinion on. I actually consider vampire kind of to be a meritocracy more than really anything else. Because it's like, you know, if you... That's one of the reasons why I think Kative are kind of on the outside looking in. Because if I was to go to DC as one of my characters, for example, I would try to curry favor with Lily as the primogen because she has power. Like, the more I see that she has power, the more merit she has to me, the more I can get. Right? Vampire society is all about what have you done for me lately. Exactly. Uh, but as I've told, as I told my players one time, and they loved this quote I told them, uh, they were asked when they first met Stanford, uh, do you know what the difference between a power and a tool is in kindred society? Tools get used all the time. Powers get used as well, but they realize they're being used and they work it to their best advantage. All right. And that's Because everyone is going to use everybody else. That's how a vampire works. No matter how powerful you are, somebody else is going to use you. The ones who become the true powers and the ones that truly, you know, increase their status and their merit are the ones that can turn even being used by somebody else to their advantage to uh, get ahead, to increase their own power in the process. And that's really what the difference. Uh, and that's what Lily has been doing. That's what Steve has been doing. He's the high team, you know, you mentioned. Uh, he's now a primogen. How did he do it? Ballsy moves and taking risks. Uh, that others may not have thought was a good idea, but uh, they worked out, you know, and he, he managed to leverage himself into a position of power to where he has power for once. Yeah. Uh, because he took some risks and, and got where he is. Uh, and that's the whole guiding principle, really. Which increases, like, kind of the merit for the character, which is like, you know, if you want to get a bit of power, you go to see Steve, you go to see Lily... You try to build yourself up and then, you know, curry favors. And that's what, that's why I call it a meritocracy because it's just like, yeah. Nobody's going to do you a favor unless you offer something to them. Yeah. I mean, just they don't do it out of kindness. No kindred does it out of the kindness in their heart, at least none consistently. There is exceptions. You know, there's always exceptions to the rule. But generally, you won't get shit from another kindred unless you're giving them something. And the ones that have the most to help you will demand the most from you to do it. Yeah. Uh, and that's how you advance the ladder. You know, you don't advance the ladder by being a nice guy. You advance the ladder by having people owe you, you owe them. You know, having the right people owe you favors is how you get, you know, more powerful. You know, or in Steve's case, just be a bastard. Uh, being known as the, the hatchet man that will do whatever it takes Uh Makes other people question to do you cross a guy who will literally do whatever it takes and doesn't care about the ethics involved in doing it? Yeah, you exactly. Know? Uh, you have to question that, and that's a different kind of power, but it's power, and it's you know he's earned it and he's earned that reputation. And yeah, you'd go to him if you wanted something very distasteful done. You go to Steve, uh, and he could you know get it done, but it's gonna cost you. Yeah. And a Canadian Captain America hopped on there with naturalist, naturalist with the dark past, naturalist with pets, naturalist with pets with the dark past. Can girls have lots of archetypes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're talking about anarchs, okay? I know this is an unpopular opinion, but the anarch movement is Camarilla like, okay? They're like the Diet Coke of the Camarilla, okay? <laughs> Uh, not quite really there, but not it's, quite really Camarilla, but not quite not. Okay, I, I would minorly disagree with that. It would be the Diet Pepsi. <laughs> okay, you go with that. Um, yeah, we don't want to be ruled by our friends, but you're still ruled by a baron. Um, you know, you still got all these rules that they put in there. Uh, they are the Diet Coke of it all. So, uh, yeah, the quite there's Yuri right there. For those in chat, Yuri and that's Steve Perry. Uh, the play, no relation. Uh, the, right there, the player. Can he hold into the status he grasped onto? That is, that's right. Uh, he is a Kai Chief who's now primogen of the clanless and unbound. Can he hold it? Uh, for a regular kindred, you talk about the Kai Chief on the outside. For a regular kindred, uh, for Lily the Tordor, it's easier for her to hold a primogen seat than it is Kai Chief. 
Uh, the fact that he, Steve Perry is a privilege, he's going to have to fight twice as hard to stay a privilege. Yeah. Because most vampires are looking for a reason to discount him and to see him topple. Life, life is generally twice as hard for a caitiff in any regard, really. Right. Uh, and for, you know, Lily the Torador, uh, she's the privilege, and uh, she has clan history and the clan backing as a whole. The Torador clan, you know, generally, in a general sense, to back her position as privilege. Uh, Kai Ti, uh, especially like Steve Barry, he only has him. Uh, there is no clan tradition to back him. There is no, you know, other primi- other Torador with a common view and a common goal uh, on his side. He has him. Yeah. Uh, and so he's going to have to really fight uh, to keep it. And he's got to stop calling the Chantry, the, the Tremere Chantry, on the phone and saying, yes, it's primogen of the ba- of the clan list on the phone. He's got to stop that. That's not a good thing to say on the phone. Um, that's a very bad thing to say on the phone, actually. Generally. Uh, and that was five minutes into the stream. <laughs> I mean, you know, even he admitted it. He made a mistake, <laughs> and it happens. All right. Um, but I don't let players back out of shit like that. If you say it, you did it. So, yeah. you know, he, he rolled with it, and he made he's, and we're working the story. And uh, I don't know if you do this. I actually talk to my players outside the game about stories a lot of times. Uh, I prep them. I'll talk about things that may be coming up or uh, run storylines with them to see how they feel about certain stories their character is involved in. Uh, because, you know, as I like to say, it's their story. I'm just a storyteller for it. So, like, Steve and I have already had a talk about things that are coming for his character, about actions and repercussions. Uh, he knows ahead of time it's coming. I don't know if you do that as well. I know Jason Carl does, because uh, I've talked to B-Dave about it. Um, I, I do a bit of that, but uh, probably not as much just yet. I'm still trying to get everybody uh, on the same into page. The, yeah. yeah, into the, into the game. I've done it with Locke. I've done it with Quartermain. I've done it with Steve, where... Sometimes I, I'll talk with, like, with Steve's case, uh, his, he didn't know who his sire was. Uh, he knew who he was, but not full details. Uh, he didn't know he was in D.C. I warned all the other players at the table but Steve privately not to push to go visit Granger because I was saving the revelation that that's Steve's sire for another event. So just if Steve comes up with it and says, let's go see Granger, whatever, roll with it. But as the players, don't push that yet. That you need to meet Granger because they were in there meet the fellow Kendrick's face. Right. Don't do that because uh, we're saving it for later. And these are the things I'll prep sometimes ahead of time with players uh, to tell a good story so that when Steve finally found out his sire was Granger, it was a shock to him. Everybody else knew it was coming, but it was a, at a good time to shock him. Yeah. You know, and I arrange this with other players from time to time. You know, uh, with Steve, we talked about what's coming up on this very next episode. Archimedes fall from uh, he knows what's coming for his character in that not in terms of details but the general idea you know uh, I find it helps him to be ready for it so you don't catch him off guard he can stay with his character who he is uh, and Jason Carl does it and I, I think some others do it as well I don't as long as you don't give out too many details but you make sure they're ready for it you know yeah just let, let them know like, a, a bit of what's coming. I, I actually had a conversation with Rose about uh, her character and what may or may not be coming down the pipe fairly soon. And but I, yeah, it's, I, it's not specific. I just let her know. You know, uh, it, it, it's really, I, I love storytelling fellers that do that so that uh, when it comes time, you're still telling, because we love the story. You know, it's all about telling the story. You know, and I think this would probably be a good point to uh, end this particular stream because yeah, uh, that'll give you enough time to uh, prepare Lily's story, right here. which will be yeah. coming out. Oh, yeah. hello, Avelian, Avelin. Yeah, Avelin is uh, Avelian is uh, one to get in the gaming Discord part of it. He's also on. He watches a lot of our stream. Uh, big Macabre Derek fan as well. Uh, so I, 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 Avelian, I call him my stalker at this point. Because <laughs> I, I keep seeing him in the same channels. Even channels he subscribed to or attended before I did. He's stalking me there. You know. Okay. 
All right, yeah. so uh, for everybody in the chat who uh, doesn't have plans to do so, at, I believe it will be 3 p.m. Pacific, Pacific. Uh, 6 Eastern, or it's minus, like, a billion or whatever, GMT, whatever that is, go over to McStabber Studios, check out the letter from the Toreador Primogen, which will be written, I believe, live by Lily, the Toreador Primogen of DC. She's uh, not going to write the whole letter. Uh, the format, she's decided she's proofreading her letter that she's written okay. uh, to a special person. Uh, she's going to proofread it on stream. Uh, so it is live, and it's going to be her being Lily. And you're going to get a revelation uh, that is a part of Chapter 2 of DC by Night that's going to shock people. Uh, especially if you're aware of uh, recent events in the vampire lore. Uh, I don't want to give away too much, but if you know shit about Chicago by night, you're going to understand the reference. That's all I'll say. Oh, all righty. So yeah. tune into that. And then after that, there will be Macabre Derek doing his... Uh, Detroit by night. Detroit yes. by night. Motor City broke down. Yep. It's very Check dark. It. It's emotionally visceral, but it's a great... Uh, show to watch. I, I, it's not my storytelling style. You know, we talk about different storytellers. It's yeah. not my style. I still love to watch it because I can learn things from him. You know? I haven't and had too much of a chance to tune into it, but I'm checking out, like, the back issues on YouTube, and I always host it. Like, I always host all the stuff. It may not be my style, but I can learn a lot by his style because different styles teach us different ways to do it, and I love watching his show. All right. Um, so... So I think we are going to... Yeah, everybody can pop in at 6. Yeah, everybody hop in. I will host it on mine. Check it out. If you can't pop in, host it. Mine as well. <laughs> you know? Well, I'll see. Don't worry, bros. I'll be in the channel. I'll, I'll be watching Vancouver by night next month. Uh, I'll be there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So yep. thank you again for doing this. This has been a great chat. Uh, I love the idea of the Storyteller Chronicles where you do... You know, bring in different storytellers uh, and talk about their own views because there's not enough of those kind of shows out there uh, where story storytellers share being a storyteller. You know, yeah, it's just not enough. We're just storytellers telling stories. Yeah. All right. And at that yeah. point, thanks again. It has been a pleasure. I will be turning it off in the most unprofessional way possible. <laughs> Flipping it to that and then going over here. And thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah.